this is the Awakening the Emergent Strategist workshop. We're going to be looking at flower essence remedies to realign the soul of humanity with the soul of nature, what some people call the anima mundi. Yeah. So let's go ahead and start. And one of the ways that we start all spirit seed classes is through a silent moment of honoring. And this is a moment to uh, really just tune in and be here now, whether that's through prayer, whether that's through libra libation, whether that's through just listening to your breath. Um, however, I want to speak a little bit about the image that you see in this picture, because I think it very much embodies what we're going to be talking about today in terms of becoming an emergent strategist. So I would argue that this little girl right here is an emergent strategist. This uh, illustration is from a book called The Village That Vanished. Anyone familiar with this book? It is one of my one of my go to favorites, a children's book children in air quotes. Um, and so in the story, it's a young uh, young girl in Africa in her village and the Portuguese slavers are coming and they they end up, the they come together, they come up with a strategy to bury all of their village possessions as if they've never been there and to leave and to come back after the slavers have left. And so they do this, they execute the plan, and then they get to a river that they cannot cross. And so on one side of them, they're facing this rushing, raging river that they cannot cross. And behind them, they hear the horse, uh, the horse, uh, I don't know what they're called. They hear the horses. They hear the slavers coming and gaining on them. And so in this scene, uh, this young girl begins to pray to her ancestors. And as she prays to her ancestors, the wind blows and reveals a path across the river on the stones. And so they are able to, it's a beautiful story. I'm not doing it justice, but they're able to be in collaboration and learn from nature, be in collaboration and learn from spirit for their own liberation. And that is really what I believe being an emergent strategist is. And so I invite us to take a few moments. Um, I'm going to set my timer. I'm going to turn off my mic. I'm going to turn off my video to just take an inward moment of love, of prayer, of gratitude, or of silence as we honor uh, the forces that have brought us here together today. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Okay, my friends, thank you so much for taking that that pause, that breath, that moment with me. Those of you who came in while we were doing that and were probably like, what is happening? I don't hear anything, nobody's talking. We were just taking a, a quiet beat, a moment of pause to bring ourselves fully here. And now that we're all here, we're gonna keep going. But for those of you who are new um, to Spirit Seed, welcome. Uh, what we are up to here at the Spirit Seed is training our community in flower essences, excuse me, wellness coaching and nature-based healing practices that are rooted in Afro-Indigenous understanding of health, humanity, nature, and the cosmos. And that's actually going to be a big aspect of what we're going to be talking about today. Our classes bring together intuitive, imaginative, and experiential learning with embodied research and academic study. And most importantly, we are co-creating a medicine for the soul. So we are taking the best and brightest of what came before us and integrating it with the best and brightest of who we are now in this moment to create a best and hopefully brighter uh, future to come. So that's what we're up to. And by being here, by lending your heart, your spirit um, to this space, um, I'm so grateful and, and welcome you here. Our ethos at the Spirit Seed, uh, we usually start our classes with a earth acknowledgement or a land acknowledgement. Um, today, we're going to just share in uh, what is the ethos and the guiding principle of everything that we do here at the Spirit Seed. I'm going to read it, but you're welcome to say it along with me to the cadence of the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, we pledge allegiance to the earth for soul awakening and remembering as part of humanity for which we stand, one heart, spirit embodied, interconnected with liberation and justice for all. So just taking a breath, letting that wash over, letting it marinate, awareness or attention to any resistance that 
comes up in response to this and any opening that emerges in response to this intention of being one heart, spirit embodied, interconnected with the intention of liberation and justice for all. So very much this work that we do for ourselves, we do for each other. Um, and we welcome you into that intention. So here we are, uh, we're gonna be talking about, about emergence and I just wanted to share a little bit of the backstory about how this particular flower essence and collaboration came to be. Uh, I have been doing my work with the Spirit Seed and teaching in our element um, as a course for several years before writing my book in our element, which is really about this way, this Afro-Indigenous way of nature being psychology. Right. And so when we look at the oldest uh, psych psychologists, they were working with the forces of nature as a way of understanding what's happening in the human psyche and the human soul. Um, pioneer in African psychology, Dr. Naeem Akbar, talks extensively about how we can use nature as a model for the human psyche. And in the course of that work, I was introduced to the emergent strategy. One of my teachers, Lori Deshar, was like, gotta read this book, you're gonna love it. It's it's all about the stuff that you like to talk about, but she brings it in another way. So as I was reading emergent strategy, one of the first things that um, Adrian Ray Brown does in the book is she references Octavia Butler. And right away I was like, oh, this is my soul sister right here because I love Octavia Butler. And it's it's this shared stream of thought around um, this return to nature as a teacher, but in a very practical, systemic way. And so my work focuses on, by and large, inner healing. And Adrienne Marie Brown takes this philosophy of looking at nature as a code for understanding collective movement and co-organization. So it was like a match made in heaven. Fast forward a few years, I was invited to go on the Emergent Strategy Ideation Institute's podcast and have a conversation with Mia Herndon about how my work intersects with Emergent Strategy. And then at the end of last year, uh, got a call saying, hey, you know, we really want to do a flower essence as a gift to the organization. And what can we create that really embodies and helps people become emergent strategists? And I was like, well, this is the stuff I've been thinking about my whole life, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. And so that's how the partnership came together and very excited that the essence is now available for purchase, to work with, to recalibrate. And this workshop today is talking about that uh, recalibration of the soul that is going to support us in being emergent strategists. And what that what does that mean? What does that look like? So I got 30 minutes. And so I'm going to talk really fast and hopefully get through a bunch of the flower essences. But again, this is lifelong work. And I do encourage you to stay connected to the spirit seed um, because all of the classes at the spirit seed weave in and out of this central philosophy of Afro-Indigenous understanding and personal healing and um, justice and liberation for all, yeah? So stay tuned is, is the short story of it. So I'm going to share this from, uh, from the book, Emergence Strategy. Emergence is our inheritance as part of the universe. It is how we change. So she's talking about this idea of emergence of being something that's intrinsic to all of us. And that emergent strategy is how we intentionally, so take now emergence is all of us, right? Emergent strategy is bringing the intention to change in ways that grow our capacity to embody the just and liberated worlds we long for. So it's taking something that's intrinsic and saying that it's not just um, part of us, but we can bring this intention to creating this world that we want and to change some of the pulse of the world that we don't want. So that really stood out to me. I mean, the whole book really, to me, reads like a prayer. I have it as an audio book and a print book. And sometimes I just listen to it on a walk and it gets my whole life together. Um, so the book is beautiful, but I, I just want to really pull that piece out. And then intersecting that with some words from my book in our element, the five elements, water, wood, fire, earth, and metal are a system for understanding 
our cycles and rhythms as part of a great and mysterious universal design. Each of these elements lives and breathes within us, showing up as different junction points and inviting us to step fully into our, our soul's calling um, and our destiny, our personal power and our destiny. So it's looking at each of the elements, these aspects of nature as, um, as forces, which we know is consistent with um, African indigenous healing practices, in addition to healing practices the world over. So when I say indigenous, before we even get into the things, what what do I mean by indigenous? So I'm just going to use a little bit of definition of terms. So the words, uh, the terms Native American, Native people, original people, indigenous, aboriginal, they're often used interchangeably, and that can often be um, confusing. A lot of times when people say indigenous, they are speaking specifically about indigenous to North America. So more of a specific to the U.S. context, which U.S tends to do. That's a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, so I'm using the term indigenous with the meaning proposed by Eduardo Duran, who has a book, several books, but one of them is called Healing the Soul Wound. And he says, regardless of the colonial identity given in a name, there is a unifying thread of identity for original people all over the world. And these different names have been used as a divisive tool of oppression. So his premise is that when you start saying Native American versus Aboriginal versus Indigenous African or just African, that you're creating these lines of divisiveness that are that are actually not true. And so when I'm speaking about Indigenous, I'm I'm talking about a heartbeat or a force or a through line, an undercurrent that underlies all Original people, um, and and ways of thinking and being in the world. And to that point, we are all indigenous to somewhere. And so in this global society where we're going to have people on Zoom from many parts of the world, people coming from different cultural contexts, just really honoring that all of us are from people who had a relationship to the world, to the natural world, because it was a global worldwide phenomenon during the time to have a different relationship with nature. So it may be healing for you to explore the ancestral roots of what draws you to this work. There's something in you that says, I want to get with plant medicine. I want to be an emergent strategist. I want to be in communion with nature in a way that is healing for myself and community. That's not just you. That's coming from somewhere. So exploring those ancestral roots. Um, I work a lot with and African diasporic wisdom traditions because that's my ancestral lineage. So you'll see me use terms like Afro-Indigenous, Africanist, or even Neo-Ancient in my recent work. Um, but does that help clarify what I'm talking about? I just want to get that out there early because, you know, that word Indigenous is, is being politicized in a lot of ways that actually inhibit the work as opposed to expand it. So our central premise here is that medicine is applied spirituality. So what the heck do I mean by that? What I mean is that your spiritual philosophy, your understanding of who you are in the cosmos and in connection to the divine is going to be showing up in a very practical way in the medicine that you practice. If you look at any culture throughout history and throughout time, you get a sense of their cosmogony by looking at their medicine. What were their tools of medicine? What was their approach to medicine? And so uh, let's let's talk about that a little bit. So when we're we have some contrasting worldviews that are intersecting in this moment when we talk about emergent strategy as a force of healing and we talk about what I like to talk about flower essences as a force of healing, we come into some contrasting applied spirituality principles. So let's just put them on the table, yeah? The first is in our relationship to time. In conventional medicine, in the current U.S. context, I'm not going to speak for the whole world, but this idea that time is linear, right? There's a beginning, middle, and end. Um, things have a cause and effect versus an Afro-Indigenous perspective of something that's called divine time, right? The right timing for something. What's interesting about both of these words, Kronos and Kairos, is that they're actually the names of gods. 
and I believe the Greek tradition, there's uh, uh, the God of Kairos and um, Kronos, which gives us chronological, right? So in these two different worldviews, we could look at things as being linear and a cause and effect. So applied spirituality, you have a disease because of a germ. The germ is the cause, the disease is the effect, right? Versus when we're looking at Afro-Indigenous wisdom, Kairos is about the opportune time, the right moment for things to occur in spontaneous emergence. So we're looking at synchronicity, we're looking at coincidence, and we're looking at signatures, right? In my work, I talk about the signatures of the each element. So it's not that your anger is causing your back pain, but how do these two symptoms emerge spontaneously to create a picture of archetypal wholeness? Y'all with me so far? All right, so we're going to keep going. I have a great example of this. I tell this story a lot. When I was in West Africa, I was staying with um, a priest named Baba Shangi. And he was, uh, he says to me, okay, today we're going to go do the naming ceremonies for the village. And I'm like, okay, what time? Right? Linear. What time? And he says, um, when everybody gets there, right? And so I'm thinking that he doesn't understand me. This wise shaman doesn't understand me, a 20-year-old, whatever. And I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, well, what time is everyone going to get there? And he's like, when it's time to start. So being connected to that pulse of the right timing of things, whether we're using astrology, whether we're using divination or other practices to tune into that right timing that isn't linear um, is a big part of what we're up to when we talk about uh, work with flower essences, of course, but also this idea of emergence, right? Non-local time. Which is why if you tell someone a party starts at five, you really mean it starts at, y'all know where I'm going with this, right? Okay, it's in our blood. All right, so <laughs> the next contrasting ideology is this idea of mechanism, this idea that the body or nature is a machine, we can dissect it, we can cut it apart, we can extract certain things from other things. So we all have maybe a heart doctor, a lung doctor, a psychiatrist, and or a foot doctor, and they may or may not all be talking to each other, right? Body is a machine, you can work on each of the individual parts, versus synergism, which is this idea that we are greater than the sum of our parts. So if you put all the little parts together in a Frankenstein kind of way, you're not going to get the thing because what's missing is the spirit that comes when people or items or things come together. So this greater than the sum of the parts is that one plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one equals two and the spirit of whatever that brought them together, right? Which brings us to our next uh, contrasting ideology, which is that materialism, everything is matter versus the Afro-Indigenous perspective that everything is energy. Everything moves, everything changed. As Octavia Butler says, everything you touch, you change. Everything you change changes you. God is change, right? So it's a, it's a different worldview. How does this show up in our lives? Well, so many ways. I'm going to really delve into that in a second. The last piece that's really big is this idea of individualism. This idea of I think, therefore I am. Um, it's centered on I and me versus communalism, which is I am because we are, which is um, us or we. So let's just talk about how these two things play out in our applied spirituality or our medicine, and I'm going to look specifically at psychology as a natural science and as a medicine, because that is the world that is most closely aligned with the work that I do, the work that we do when we're working with things like flower essences and plant medicine and, and, and all the things. Yeah. Okay. So we can trace psychology, modern psychology to 17th century philosopher Rene Descartes. Y'all might know this name from Cartesian logic when we talk about Cartesian logic. So he is most known for his theory of dualism, which declared the mind and body as two separate distinct entities. So right away, we have a shift from African indigenous thought that says that mind, body, and spirit are on a continuum because everything is energy and nothing is static and everything moves, right? 
And so <clears throat> his approach to dualism did not just separate the body from the mind. It, ser it separated humanity from nature, nature from spirit, and by extension, humanity from the spirit of nature. Y'all following? So when we talk about something like an emergence flower essence, we are going against this because we're saying that my human soul has something to learn from the spirit of nature. The other piece that we have with individualism is y'all might be familiar with this pyramid and we have self-actualization at the top of the pyramid as the highest ideal. Well, when they're talking about self, they're talking about the individual self, right? That's different from this, I am um, because we are approach. So I think this quote is from Outcast. This That's how I, no one is free while others are oppressed. I learned it from Outcast in one, one of their songs, but I, I think there's some debate online about who said it first, but I'm gonna just go ahead and quote Outcast. But my point is, is that it's a different philosophy. So in this system, your freedom, your independence, your self-actualization is the highest goal. In an Afro-Indigenous view, if you have all of that, but everyone around you is suffering, then you are not successful, right? And so it's a, a shift or a difference in the way that we are even perceiving what it means to be psychologically well. In one system, psychologically well means you. And in another system, psychologically well means we, us, ours. Uh, a person is a person through other people is what this what the saying means. Um, we are not individually defined. My humanity is caught in inextricably bound in the humanity of others. There is no me without we. Yeah? Different worldview. So this individualism and materialism kind of come together in a way that is, I think, detrimental to the collective soul. And this work right here, this work around individualism and materialism is actually what brought me into the academic world because it was the um, the foundation of my master's thesis when I was at NYU. Before I was doing any of this healing stuff, um, that's what I was really invested in. How did we get here and what do we do about it? So just looking at this, this brilliant destructive crash of materialism and individualism which came together in a really big way during the so-called age of enlightenment so this was a philosophical movement during um in europe in uh, euro america that centered the idea that reason is the primary source of authority um and these ideas of liberty progress tolerance fraternity constitutional government separation of church and state on and on and on and things, but this was like the age of enlightenment for the Western world. And really what it highlighted was this idea of individualism and materialism as the foundation of, um, of knowledge, the foundation of society. We could make some parallels between the movement from an earth-centered um, universe to discovering that the sun was the center of the universe, discovering, right? It's a for those of you who are into astrology and astrotheology, it's like a shift in the consciousness of the worldview, right? So what this clash came together with uh, created colonialism and imperialism, slavery and genocide, oppression of indigenous people and land. This is all under the thrust of individualism and materialism. Um, so here's an example, our, our original Uncle Sam, um, Mr. Cartwright here, he invented this term called drapetomania, which, quote, is a psychological disorder that caused enslaved, black, enslaved Blacks to want to run away from bondage. So in other words, if you are a slave and you want to run away from the good graces of your slave owners, then that's a psychological disorder, Right. Medicine is applied spirituality. There was a, I can't remember the name of it. There was another disorder for slave owners who wanted to free their slaves, right? And so there was research and diagnosis and treatments. We can imagine what the treatments were, right? To mitigate the deviant tendency of Blacks to escape. Medicine is applied spirituality, right? So if I believe that I'm an in individual, if I believe that, um, mind and body are separate, if I believe that man is superior to nature, 
if I believe that my culture is superior to all other living beings, then we kind of get a confluence of stuff that is not too great for, I would say, 95% of the planet. Yeah, no matter where your ancestors fall on the line, wasn't good for any of us, this individualism and materialism. So what I invite us to consider is that these are the waters we swim in. We swim in these waters in such a way that we are not even conscious of the ways that we perpetuate individualism, materialism, and we are not conscious of, of the ways that those ideologies that live within us affect our ability to heal and to organize and to change the pulse and the current of where society is going. Which brings us to the emergence flower essence. So uh, a, a few of the things that the emergence flower essence was co-created to address is to recalibrate our intuitive inner compass towards personal and collective transformation. Again, it's not about me, it's about we. What do I need to reframe in my own psyche to welcome that? Um, to tune to my unique gifts. I talk about this polarity in my book when I talk about the balance between the wood and the earth element, that it's not me versus we, it's both at the same time happening. My individual gifts, my collective support, and they feed each other. Um, and then also to attract and work with your soul squad for a deeper sense of community. The people who are your people, regardless of where they live or what they look like. Um, we are using this essence to reconnect with the natural world as a source of wisdom and intelligence and to awaken our sensitivity and alignment with Earth's cycles and rhythms. And then this, I think, is hugely important to examine our personal role in how that we perpetuate these wounds of individualism, materialism, excessive consumption, systemic oppression, meaning that we are all complicit in these things if we live on this earth because it's the waters we swim in. And last but not least, how do we cultivate hope in the face of such fuckery? <laughs> Gotta say it, right? How do some of us give up? And we're like, well, I can't do anything. And so how do we restore the hope and the resilience of nature herself in our own heart and souls? Y'all still with me? So what are flower essences? Well, we are not going to get into all of that right now, but there is a workshop next Sunday. You can see it on the Spirit Seed work, um, website where two of our senior uh, practitioners will be leading a workshop that goes into the ins and outs of flower essences if you're interested in learning more. Um, but I will just start by saying that essential oils and flower essences are not the same thing. So for today, we are not talking about the essential oils that you buy and use in aromatherapy. We're talking about um, these herbal vibrational remedies that you take internally. So you, a couple drops under your tongue, a little dab will do you, that kind of thing. If you've never heard of flower essences, you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, please consider coming to the free workshop next Sunday. I just don't want anyone to ask me what the emergence flower essence smells like, okay? It don't smell. Those are essential oils. Anyway, okay. So jumping back and taking a step back, when we look at flower essence formula design, uh, we use the principle of sacred geometry. So rather than looking at the amount of flower essence, we look at their relationship to one another in a sacred formula to create coherence. So when we started designing this formula, we started with the archetype of four and creating a formula that is essentially two interconnected fours, which you can see here. This is the design of the essence because four is the archetypal number of matrical relationships, meaning non-hierarchical, meaning circular relationships instead of linear relationships. It's the number of stability. It's the number archetypally that represents community reciprocity, balance, and the earth herself. So we see in the background here, there's an image of Ma'at, um, which is that, that force in the Kemetic tradition around community reciprocity and balance. So we're calling in right from the beginning, this energy of community and non-hierarchical relationship uh, between beings. And so this is what the formula looks like. 
And these are the flowers that are in the formula. I'm just going to name them and then I'm going to talk about a few of them specifically. But we have spreading flocks, we have wild oat, quaking grass, downy avens, green rose, green acociana, corn, sweet pea, green cross gentian, and then a little hit of turquoise essence on the side. So I'm going to share a little bit about the formula and the essences. The upper quadrant of this double four is about the realization of our personal destiny within the context of community. The flowers help us attract and recognize our soul squad and the purposeful work we are meant to do together. The flowers also work together to support collective cooperative work and responsibility in spite of our indoctrination in an individualist paradigm. So that's a really fancy way of saying, can we all just get along? And can I attract the people that I am going to work with and grow with and be in community and solidarity with as I live out my destiny, which is connected to the world destiny? The bottom quadrant is about our relationship to the natural world and our ability to attune to her resilience and infinite perennial wisdom. They help to facilitate an awareness of our personal collective habits um, that get in the way of our connection to our earth and her rhythms and cause harm to our planet. So while I was working with this flower essence, for instance, I realized that I was using coffee, lattes specifically, daily, like an addiction, to numb my sensitivity. And I didn't realize I was doing that until I started working with this essence. I didn't realize how much I was um, Amazon binging whenever I felt stress and I would just order or buy something to feel better, right? These were all subconscious mechanisms that were happening, but destroying my relationship to the earth and in turn destroying the earth with my actual overconsumption habits, right? So the flower essence helped to bring those to the forefront for me. Um, and it's also about establishing a sense of home, especially if we descend from a lineage of forced displacement, um, whether that's through immigration or refugee or um, ma'afa, um, how do we live into the ancestral worldviews that perceive humans as an interconnected thread in the web of life and the natural world as our wise teacher? So I'm curious to see how that shows up for each of you as you as you work with the essence, if you choose to work with the with the essence. I'm going to just highlight a few of these flowers. Um, again, I wish I could talk about them all at length, but if you are interested in this work, I do encourage you to check out the In Our Element class that starts in a week and a half, um, as well as some of the other classes that are on the Spirit Seed website. So first, I'm going to start with Spreading Flocks, and Spreading Flocks is a very vertical, I mean, not vertical, horizontal flower. It proliferates um, almost in a kind of circular way, as opposed to those plants that grow really high and strong. And that speaks to its communal quality. And we use this flower essence to um, really call in that soul squad. In African indigenous thought, we might call it the egg bay, or you're like your spiritual family, your soul family, the people that you are meant to be here with. In some spiritual traditions, they say you y'all made a contract and agreed to come down here together and do some things. And so this flower essence helps you to find the people to help you do those things, right? Um, and to also really re-examine the superficial relationships that are not furthering your destiny. So when I was working with this essence, I took like a month hiatus from social media just so that I could recalibrate what it meant to be in meaningful relationship with the people that I'm sharing my energy with. Um, so that was my personal exploration of this. And I'm, again, I'm curious, it's going to look different for, for each of us. The next flower essence, I really am inspired by this quote um, from a poem called A Blessing for Presence by John O'Donohue, uh, where in the middle of the poem, he says, may you respond to the call of your gift and find the courage to follow its path. And that idea of that call, I think, is a big piece of what drew me to emergent strategy, but also what is talked about in the book when we see a flock of birds, they don't necessarily all say, hey, yeah, let's go over the air. But there's this intuitive call that they're all responding to and moving together. And I believe that the more we are tuned into that internal call, even if we're not necessarily having 
the specific conversations were all in emergence moving towards the same place. At least that's my, my hope and prayer and what comes forward in this poem for me. And that flower essence that offers that gift is wild oat. Um, wild oat is very much about really finding your calling, really finding the unique gift of what brought you here and what to do with what you've got. It does build confidence. It does build, build clarity in your specific life path and, and how to be in right relationship with your inner guidance, with your inner compass, or we might say your ori or your higher self, right? How do I get in right relationships so that I can really see myself as part of this interconnected thread? This is one of the flower essences I talk about a lot in the wood chapter of In Our Element. So you can definitely read more about this flower essence. It is one of the flower essences that Dr. Bach himself called one of the most important remedies of our times. And the last, not the last, but yeah, the last flower essence I'll talk about is Downy Avens. And this one I think is just really, you know, we live in such a time where because of that age of enlightenment thrust of this particular type of intelligence, we tend to over rely on and over validate our intellectual processes. And I'm not saying that we don't need our good sense. I'm not saying that we don't need to use reason and good logic, but it is not the only or most important way. A lot of indigenous cultures believe that the true intelligence lies in the heart. And so the Downy Avens flower essence is about integrating what we know intellectually with what we know in our heart space. It is about softening our heart so that we can be receptive and perceptive um, of other ways of knowing and bring that into our understanding of life. You know, we, we start teaching kids the alphabet when they're two, right? And we get really proud about how smart they are. And sometimes we're compromising a different type of intelligence and knowing that comes through play and creativity. A lot of that right brain activation that neuroscience is just beginning to scratch the surface of and understanding why it's more about the relationship between things as opposed to the things themselves. Um, so we see this pulse, this emergence, right? Moving in the sciences and the natural science, moving in the healing professions, moving in spiritual circles. It's about, wait a minute, there's another way to be. There's another way to be. And how can we all answer and respond to that call together? I love all these flower essences. I feel really sad that I can't talk about all of them. But again, I do encourage you to stay connected. I'm going to fast forward a little bit um, to what to expect when you're working with flower essences, messages and dreams. My ancestors are, ancestors are always sending me songs. I wake up in my head with a song in my head. And, you know, I know that there's a message there. There might be books you feel drawn to. When I was working with this essence, I discovered a book called The Afro Minimalist Guide to Living with Less. And it really started me to have this conversation on my relationship with stuff and consumption and having more than I need. And also what's the existential fear behind the consumption and how do I break that cycle? Um, you'll maybe look for changes in your sleep, your dietary habits, your spiritual routines, your relationship with nature how to be in a reciprocal relationship with communities of shared purpose and also um, synchronicity and meaningful coincidence that might show up to drive you in a direction towards your purpose, your calling. I'll close with this, this uh, insight, walking, I am listening in a deeper way. Suddenly all my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say, watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. And so as we breathe in that love of thousands, that, that pulse, that current that brings us here, that pulse, that current that even makes us curious about emergent strategy, about flower essences, about this work, about this community, uh, we know that we're not individualists, that we are actually the result of an ancient legacy and lineage that brings us here now. And so we, we honor that. I want to close out so that I can make space for our next presenter, but I will just let you know that if you are interested in the two fall winter courses that we're offering at the Spirit Seed, uh, the first is Inner Element, which is looking at each of the five elements as signatures and um, soul, soul cycles. 
So looking at the specific flower essences going in deeper, like the flower essences I shared just now, that class starts in about a week and a half. And then our Into the Depths class is a soul healing class looking at the nonlinear process of transformation. If you are interested in taking both of those classes, you can um, use the code first class. I'll send a special link to register for both classes and you save close to $500. Um, or you can look and take each of these classes individually, whichever speaks to you or calls you or just makes you a little bit curious or open or receptive. Um, so I'll post those links in the chat. And then last but not least, you can get in touch with me through um, all the places you love to buy books. My book is called In Our Element. Um, it's available um, as an audio book as well as a print form and on Kindle. And I think that's it. I'll stop here. So thank you all for being here.